morning. My name is Zore Saher, and I'm a policy analyst at the AUMA, the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. So welcome to today's webinar on records management. Before we start, I have some details about our webinar technology to share. At any time during the webinar, you will be able to use the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen to communicate with us. If you encounter any sound or other technical difficulties, please use the chat box to tell us about the problem right away so we can address it. As well, you can type in a comment or ask a question about the presentation at any time. Your questions or comments will be visible to all participants and will be responded to at the end of the presentations. We recorded the webinar and we'll publish an article in our digest newsletter to let you know, to let you know when it's available. I'll turn things over to our uh, presenters for this session. So our first presenter is Maureen Johnson, Manager of Standards and Innovation Information Management Branch with Service Alberta. Our second presenter is Jody Jackson, the Information Management Team Lead with Sturgeon County. Our third and final presenter is Kirsty Eifert, Legislative Advisor with the City of Coal Lake. So um, we're very pleased to have all three of these presenters here today. I'm going to hand things over to them. And, so, um, and feel free, as I mentioned, to put in your questions in the chat box, and we will address them at the end of the session. So I'll hand things over to Maureen now. Thanks, Zoray. Um, as Zoray mentioned, I've uh, been with Service Alberta um, for about a year. I have a bit of a portfolio career. I've been with the government for about 15 years, and I've been in the information management realm for about three years. Um, I'm here today to talk about information management in the government of Alberta, and I'm going to focus on two key areas in my presentation. First, I'm going to give an overview of the IM program itself. I'll talk about uh, guiding legislation and roles and responsibilities, and then I'll speak to a few initiatives that we have underway. Um, before I get started in the program overview, I want to give a brief explanation of how Service Alberta fits into the overall government picture. So Service Alberta is one of 19 Government of Alberta departments. It's responsible for providing services to Albertans, including registries, land titles, consumer protection, and the Queen's, Alberta Queen's Printer. In addition to information management and FOIP, Service Alberta also is in a unique position where they provide support to the rest of government for common corporate functions such as IT, pay and benefits, uh, procurement to name a few. So Service Alberta approaches information management from the enterprise perspective, and I'll get into more detail on that when I talk about roles and responsibilities. Uh, first I'm going to talk about legislation. So information management is a legislative requirement in the government of Alberta. All government information must be managed in accordance with the records management regulation. This requirement applies to all government of Alberta departments as well as agencies, boards, and commissions that are identified under Schedule 1 of the FOIP Act. Um, FOIP is the access and privacy legislation that applies to public bodies like government departments as well as municipalities and schools. It protects an individual's privacy by setting out rules for the collection, use, disclosure, retention, and security of personal information. It allows for access to information, provides a method to request it, and provides a means for an independent review of decisions. So this slide also lists a number of other pieces of legislation that are relevant to managing information in the government and the name of the administering department. So it's important to understand here that there isn't just one piece of legislation for information management and that all acts play an important role in managing information. For example, when a record's final disposition is permanent retention, it's actually transferred to the Provincial Archives of Alberta, or the PAA. The Historical Resources Act identifies the responsibilities of the PAA for the acquisition and pre preservation of government records. It also identifies the PAA as the official repository for government records of enduring value. And Alberta Culture and Tourism is responsible for this act. <clears throat> When it comes to accountability for managing information, it extends right across the government. Um, first of all, the Minister of Service Alberta is responsible for the establishment of a records management program for the GOA. 
The minister may establish, maintain, and promote policies, standards, and procedures for the creation, handling, control, organization, retention, maintenance, security, preservation, disposition, alienation, and destruction of records in the custody or under the control of the departments and for their transfer to the provincial archives. That was a very long sentence. Um, the Deputy Minister of Service Alberta is responsible for the Enterprise Information Management Program and also serves as the chair of something called the DMIMIT Committee, which I'll explain a little bit later, um, and provides enterprise level direction to and assesses the GOA approach to information management, including things like data sharing, open data systems, and rationalized operations. So that's on the Service Alberta side. Deputy Ministers of, of Government of Alberta departments are ultimately accountable for managing information in the custody or under the control of their specific departments. They can assign specific responsibility for managing information resources to others in the department, and I will explain that in a bit as well. As far as the Information Management Branch, where I work in Service Alberta, they provide corporate government of Alberta leadership and establish strategic approaches and plans for records and information management. So our group establishes policies, standards, and strategies to manage GOA information assets. We provide records and information shared services to GOA departments, agencies, boards, and commissions. We play a lead role in promoting, coordinating, and communicating records and information management developments with other jurisdictions, as well as with professional organizations and associations. And we provide general advice and support to department information management practitioners, as well as to external and public requesters. Um, so the information management branch is um, split into two, uh, two sides. We have a strategic focus, as well as an operational focus. On the strategic end, um, and that, that is the area that I work in, we establish enterprise direction, um, provide guidance and awareness and support for the enterprise program through information management strategy, policy and planning, projects and training, and compliance and reporting. On the operational side, they look after managing active records, classification design, retention schedule development, file room management, records disposition, forms and e-business, imaging services, storage and disposal. So I mentioned uh, a little while ago that the Deputy Minister of Service Alberta serves as the chair of the DMIMIT committee, so that's the Deputy Minister Information Management Information Technology Committee. There's also an Assistant Deputy Minister IMIT committee as well as the Alberta Records Management Committee. And the ARMC is a legislative committee um, spelled out in the records management regulation. I also mentioned that GOA uh, deputy ministers across the departments have the ability to assign or delegate responsibility for managing information to others in their departments. So in every department in the government, we have uh, four positions. One is the Department Chief Information Officer. They, they look after the um, IT side of things. We have a Senior Records Officer who's responsible for records and information management. We have Freedom of Information and Privacy Coordinators in each department, as well as a Ministry Information Security Officer. So um, on the corporate side of things for GOA as a whole, we have corporate a corporate Chief Information Officer and a Corporate Information Security Officer, but there's also those functions within each department that basically implement the um, enterprise direction that's uh, given to them from the corporate um, positions. As well, um, program executives and managers, information management practitioners, and all GOA employees have a role to play in the accountability for information management. Now I'll talk about some of the initiatives that we have underway. Um, and I think probably this first one a lot of us can relate to. And I like to talk about the paradox of email. Um, email is a useful communications and scheduling tool when it's managed appropriately. However, a uh, cluttered mailbox is difficult to maintain and impacts our productivity and the ability to find information. For many of us, unfortunately, the goal of a zero inbox is probably not very realistic. Um, as the sender, so this this um, graphic is a somewhat of an illustration of of 
what the email paradox is all about. So the one rock on the right hand side as the sender, email is a simple, fast and convenient way to communicate with one or many people. You write the email, you send the email. On the flip side, the four rocks, the heavy four rocks on the left hand side, the activities involved in managing email as the recipient are complex, time consuming and inefficient. As the recipient, you check the inbox, scan subjects, open email, read email, decide how, when and if to reply, mark it as unread, set a reminder, find the email again if you can and then reply. As well, most of us spend the majority of time focusing on what's in the inbox rather than in the sent items folder where most of the official records we generate actually reside. So that just gives you a little background as to the challenge that we all face with managing our email. Um, as of this summer, Service Alberta will be moving away from using a third party archiving tool. We use Enterprise Vault. Most of the other departments that were using it have already moved away from it. So Service Alberta is going to be uh, restoring archived email back into the Outlook environment. Once that's done, the information management branch is going to coordinate an email management initiative within the department to help raise awareness about the importance of proper management practices in people's day to day work and help them manage their email. This event is a joint effort between information management and IT in Service Alberta and the focus here is going to be on managing information using the technology from the perspective that technology is the enabler not the driver. We want to move away from, um, from just focusing on the tool and focusing on how the tool can help people manage their information. We'll provide assistance um, and advice on best practices through tip sheets that we've created and we have those posted, we will be having those posted to our website to show employees how to reduce the amount of rot or redundant obsolete trivial information stored in their Outlook environment. As well as email management, um, the email management event that we have coming up, Service Alberta is also leading a cross-ministry working group for email management and it's made up of staff from departments that have previous experience in email management initiatives. So before the webinar actually got started, we were having a conversation in the room. One of my uh, previous roles, I worked in, a, in another department that actually had an initiative to help people clean up their email. Now we're doing something similar in Service Alberta. So the departments that have experience in, in doing email management initiatives are part of this working group. The working group will develop recommendations and best practices and consult with the broader information management community prior to rolling out a finished product for all of GOA. Other work that we do with email management is we work with other jurisdictions. So there's a joint council, a federal, provincial, territorial council called Public Service Chief Information Officer Council or PSCIOC, we love our acronyms. Uh, the Information Management Subcommittee of that Joint Council has developed four email management guiding principles from input across all federal, provincial, territorial jurisdictions in Canada. This information is available on our website which I'll mention at the end of the presentation. We also do a fairly regular e-scan of what other jurisdictions are doing with regards to email management models. For example, there's a role-based retention model called Capstone in the United States. Um, basically, the, um, the more significant or the higher up in the organization a position is, um, that position is deemed to um, warrant having all of the email retained for an extended period of time. Uh, we also look at the how people are using various user applied retention policies. For example, in Outlook you have the ability to apply say a 30 day retention to a folder so that you can help manage your email that way. Moving on from email management, our next major initiative that we have underway is the Records Schedule Reengineering Project. We've recently initiated this project to re-engineer the records retention schedule process in the government. This initiative was identified in recommendations from the Information Management Program Review that we conducted in 2014. So the recommendations out of that review were to re-engineer the scheduling and disposition process so that it becomes more relevant, timely, efficient and simple reduce the number of schedules that are currently in use, um, ensure the uh, supporting software system used for scheduling and disposition is relevant and responds to current business requirements, and ensure the schedule process, pardon me, the schedule approval process is standardized and communicated clearly across government. 
So we're doing this project through a phased approach. We're going to first look at developing the new process, methodology, and business requirements for a supporting enterprise application. Then we're going to test the methodology on select records retention schedules, including corporate schedules that apply to common functions across government, and develop procedures and documentation to assist the senior records officers across government in implementing the new process within their departments. So the goals of the project, the, the overall goal of the project is to increase efficiency and effectiveness of the scheduling process. We want to streamline the process. We want to standardize retention periods where possible, so looking at taking a big bucket approach where possible, as well as reducing the number of retention schedules. So work is already underway. Uh, the project is expected to be completed by September 2017 and will involve participation from subject matter experts across government. Within Service Alberta, we have the project team that's made up of business analysts who are um, um, reviewing and validating relevant material gathered from cross-government consultations during that IM program review. They're conducting jurisdictional scans to see what other jurisdictions are doing with regards to scheduling and updating current state business process maps. We will also be putting together a working group and a steering committee made up of cross-ministry staff from um, the areas of records and information management, FOIP, archives, and IT expertise. Uh, consultation will take place within the records management and information management communities across government. Moving on to managing ministers' office records. In conjunction with the FOIP office, our branch offers information management and FOIP training to ministers and deputy ministers office staff. Um, this training was originally intended to be for ministerial staff only, but we recognize the value of including deputy ministers office staff as well, since both offices work so closely with each other and it gives everyone a much better understanding and appreciation for how information is managed. Recognizing that our guidance is a little bit different than what happens in the municipal environment, the idea of separating different types of records and managing them accordingly is a concept that can be applied in any level of government or organization. So we talk about the different types of records that are found in ministers' offices. So for us, we have two types of records. One would be government records, and those would be either departmental records that pertain to the mandate of the department or the general um, administration of the minister's office, and we have cabinet records. So those would be cabinet activities or um, cabinet committee and subcommittees. Both departmental and cabinet records fall within the Records Management Regulation and the FOIP Act. The other types of records found in ministers' offices would be constituency and personal records, and both of those are considered to be personal property of the minister and do not fall under the Records Management Regulation or FOIP Act. We cover the, who is responsible for managing the different types of records in accordance with legislation and applicable retention schedules. So department records fall within the responsibility of the department. So the department records may be in the minister's office for a period of time. Once that need has ended, the, the um, department records get transferred back to the department where they're managed there. Uh, for cabinet records, executive council is ultimately responsible for managing these records. So again, they're the ones that are responsible for maintaining the master copy of all cabinet records. When it comes to constituency and personal records, those belong to the minister. So when the minister leaves the portfolio, they have the option of either taking the records with them, destroying them, or transferring them to the provincial archives for permanent retention. Um, we talk about information management with regards to privacy and access. So it's important to safeguard information for appropriate collection and use. And we routinely, we, we want to encourage routine deletion or destruction of transitory material. Now it's not about hiding in anything, it's basically making sure that you're managing your information properly and retaining only what you need to make it faster and more efficient to find information. I like to liken it to uh, when you're getting ready to move to a new house. If you've stayed on top of um, managing your household, it isn't such a burden when it comes to purging at the last minute before you move. Um, additional tools and resources. So the most of the um, information management piece of the 
uh, managing records and ministers offices training that we do comes from a managing records and ministers offices guideline document which we have on our website and again um, that website address for you is www.im.gov.ab.ca. That's where we have um, all of our publications and legislation information for the information management program with government. Some other initiatives <coughs> that we're working on. First is the Action Request Tracking System Review. So Service Alberta is the owner of the enterprise application known as the Action Request Tracking System, or ARTS. It was implemented back in 2000 to track action requests for correspondence and responses between ministers' offices and deputy ministers' offices. The system has evolved beyond its original purpose over time and is now used to track a variety of requests for information. Uh, Service Alberta has undertaken a review of the action request process, business requirements, and art system functionality to address a number of um, issues, including compliance with the government-wide information management program, the development of standardized business rules, and compliance with rules and conventions of the British um, Westminster parliamentary system with respect to access to documents by outgoing and incoming administrations during government transition. The review included an online survey of over 7,000 arts users, as well as in-person interviews with key contacts in each department to discuss the action request business process. An action plan and recommendations have been developed and brought forward to Service Alberta Executive, including re-establishing a governance committee structure to provide strategic oversight of the business process and supporting application, and enhancements to improve records management functionality and user experience within the application itself. Further consultation with GOA stakeholders will take place at various points in the project over the next couple of years. The Managing Information Act is in the early stages of development. This act is intended to be an overarching legislation uh, regarding the management of information across the government of Alberta that is paramount over other acts and also refers to information and records such as the Health Information Act and Freedom of Information Act. So earlier in the presentation I mentioned that there are a number of different acts that touch various pieces of managing information. So this act is intended to be that overarching umbrella. Um, the Act also includes mandating that the digital record is the official record of the Government of Alberta and will be actively managed. The digital standards package is something that we have identified. Um, a set, we have identified a set of standards that will help us move the government into the digital world. And these standards are at various stages of development. Um, there's about uh, 10 or 12 standards. Last month, for example, the core content metadata standard was approved and ratified. So this means that our four core metadata um, items are title, author, date created, date modified. This standard is a foundational set of elements that enables interoperability. Uh, right now, the Open Government Metadata Standard and the GeoDiscover Metadata Standard both reference the core content metadata standard as a foundation piece, and implementation of the standard has begun. And finally, with forms and imaging, we're in the process of finalizing a new dig digitization services and resources pre-qualified resource list, or PQR, of service providers to replace the existing PQR that expires on March 31st, 2017. We anticipate that the new PQR will be issued within the next month or so. And we're also reviewing the printed stationery, so business cards, envelopes, letterhead, that kind of thing, uh, reviewing the printed stationery standing offer contract that expires on, this, on January 31st, 2017. And that wraps up my intro to um, information management in Service Alberta. And I believe we're leaving questions to the end. Thank you, Mary. My name is Jody Lyons Jackson. I have been in a records management and FOIP role uh, for the past 12 years with Sturgeon County. During um, my part of the presentation, um, I would like to focus on the following objectives. I would like to cover the overview of the FOIP principles, identify records of an elected official, talk a bit about compliance at meetings and working with the public, and finally, um, 
touch on a few privacy and security tips. So first there are two elements set out in the first act. Simply put, it governs the protection and use of records in your custody. First, this describes what records the public body must provide access to you, not only to the public, but for you. Can um, so it's about rules around the collection, use, and disclosure. Okay. We're mm -hmm. trying to fix the volume here. Access to public body records. That's better. Okay. This is on your feet. <laughs> okay, let's try again. Um, so back up with this. Um, uh, the first act um, is uh, made up of two elements. Is it? We're still having volume. It is my turn. I know. Can um can everyone hear me now? Okay. Yes, better. Okay. Okay, I'm not going to move. <laughs> okay. I promise I won't move. Um, it also provides rules around the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information. If an elected official feels a record is not a municipal record or public body record, it has been our experience as a best practice to protect that record as though it is subject to privacy provisions. The Privacy Commissioner will have the power to compel the production of documents if need be. Oh, she does. Yes, it's possible. Okay, I am going to back up one slide. Okay, so there are two elements set out in the playback. Simply put, it governs the protection use and use of records in your custody. First, it subscribes what records a public body must provide access to, not only for the public, but for you. It also provides rule a muscle again. Okay. Am I muffled? This one not here. Okay. We apologize. We are going to switch um, headsets quickly. Please. Okay. Can I double it in? Okay, this is a test. Can you hear me better? Much better. Yes. All right. <laughs> and I won't move. Okay. So I'll start at the beginning again. There are two elements set out in the playback. Simply put, it governs the protection and use of records in our custody. First, it subscribes what records the public body must provide access to, not only for the public, but for you as an elected official. It also provides rules around the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information. 
If an elected official feels a record is not a municipal or public body record, it has been our experience as a best practice to protect the record as though it is subject to the privacy provisions. The Privacy Commissioner will have the power to compel the production of documents if need be. The FOIP Act sets out provisions that allow anyone to request access to records under the custody and control of a public body. However, the Act not only identifies personal information but that may not be disclosed, but it also identifies types of sensitive information that a municipality may or must withhold. For example, this third party business information, confidential evaluations, draft legal instruments, economic and business interests all have sensitive information that must be considered. So what do the access provisions mean to you? First, always keep in mind that the playback will always apply. Everything is portable. Once the access provisions are engaged from the outside, we must look internally at our content and respond compliantly. Again, this applies to your notes, email, correspondence, messages, and any documents, reports, agendas, minutes you have accumulated while representing the office and while conducting public body business. Once the request is received, each of us has a duty to assist. This means when your public body notifies you of a request and calls for all responsive records in your custody, you must respond completely. You need to consider all of your records, but it's not up to you to decide what you would like to withhold. Also, taking your time to respond is not a helpful strategy. On the contrary, it only increases the officer's ability to respond within the time parameters. Once we have received the request, collect all the census records. It is then that we review the request, collect all. So it is then that we review the content and look at the exceptions to withhold sensitive and personal information. You can move it. I hold it and I held it. It worked well. You try. When required, the FOIP coordinator will solicit you for concerns and position regarding the disclosure. Don't hesitate to bring these concerns forward when you hand in your content by flagging it for consideration. Once those areas of concern are identified, the FOIP coordinator will determine if the public body can sever the sensitive content and ensure that the public body is able to reasonably substantiate their application of the Act. Note, provisions should be applied in a limited fashion. Um, although content may or must be severed, it's not completely straightforward. There are still a number of considerations that must be reviewed. Remember, your FOIP coordinator is your ally during this process. They will work with you and the legislation to ensure the application of an exception is best suited to support its release or non-disclosure. The Office of the Privacy Commissioner relies on the FOIP coordinator when performing their investigations to provide explanations and a better understanding of public body processes. Since personal information is defined as any information about an identifiable individual, this could include their name, address, sex, age, race, um, a municipality must consider or ensure the protection of this information, not only of its residents but also of its own employees. This part of the Act also provides guidance to administration when disclosing and providing access to information to not only the public but to the employees and its elected officials. To share information compliantly, a public body must now must follow the provisions set out within the Act, including providing access use of personal information for consistent use. As a public body employee, volunteer, or elected official, one does not automatically inherit access to any and all public body information. One is only given access if it is needed to do their job. 
The FOIA Act provides direction in determining when we can collect, use, and disclose such information, and it sets out that the municipality or public body must make reasonable security arrangements to protect personal information. So accountable, uh, defined in the Oxford Dictionary, is of being liable to be called to account, to have or to have an explanation or to be responsible. In our roles as public body servants, we all must be accountable. Privacy provisions within the FOIA Act cover our obligations as a public body. Privacy is protected by setting rules around how we collect and use and disclose personal information by giving the individuals the right to access their own personal information and gives them the ability to request corrections. It provides um, the ability to give notice to individuals when collecting their information and stating our authority to do so. It requires us to employ security standards to protect against unauthorized access, collection, use, and disclosure. And it helps to set retention requirements on personal information used to make decisions affecting individuals. And finally, it provides an opportunity for that independent review by the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner in circumstances when um, an individual feels their personal information has not been handled fairly. We cannot collect personal information unless we have the authority to do so. That is bottom line. If another enactment does not specifically speak to or permit the collection, we need to ask ourselves, is the personal information necessary to operate this program or activity of the public body? Also, consent is not one of the recognized collection authorities in the FOIA Act. Even if with the consent of the individuals, the FOIA Act must still permit the public body to collect personal information. So we've seen in the, the past um, collection of consent um, where uh, public body employees have thought that that gives them the authority to collect information. And although we have the um, consent of the individual, it still does not give us the authority. Once a public body has personal information in their custody and control, they can only use it if it is for a consistent purpose, unless consent is obtained. For example, in a municipality, the names and mailing addresses of property owners are collected for the purpose of operating the municipality including compiling the tax assessment role. This information may be used for other purposes related to the operation of the municipality, such as providing services and utilities, like snow removal, water connection, etc. This is considered a consistent purpose. Disclosure is permissible when required to do a job or deal with a particular situation. These circumstances are listed in the Act. Disclosure of personal information within a public body is permissible when particular personal information is needed for an employee to do their job or deal with a particular situation. Only those employees with a legitimate need to view or have records containing personal information can have it. When employees do not obtain, or sorry, do obtain personal information, they must only use it and disclose it for the purposes for which it was collected or for a purpose permitted under the Act. So just because we have the authority to use and disclose ratepayers' personal information doesn't mean there isn't limits. Remember, it's on a need-to-know basis. Records that fall within the scope of the FOIA Act apply to the records under the custody and control of a public body. The difference between con constituency and municipality records are depicted in this slide. Remember, it is constituency records that are excluded from the Act. Therefore, it's very important to understand the difference between the two. Custody includes records in the pos possession of the public body, including circumstances when a third party's records are kept on the premises. For example, a water commission. A record under the control means that the public body has the authority to manage the record, including restricting, regulating, and administrating, sorry, administering their use, disclosure, and final disposition. Usually, you see this managed by way of a records retention bylaw or a corporate record structure. If you find yourself hung up and not quite sure, ask yourself these que questions to help identify the type of record you are working with. If the answer is yes, you can be certain it is a municipal record which falls under the FOIA Act. 
Does the record show proof or evidence of my activities as an elected official? Does the information relate to my role as an elected official? Or was the data provided to me so that I can make an informed decision for the public body I represent? We all understand the importance of public meetings and value in supporting democratic and transparent governance. While making decisions and hearing from the public in an open arena, we risk the chance of unintentional collection and use of sensitive information, including unauthorized disclosure. In addition to the information shared in agenda packages and during these meetings, some agenda items are walked on or accepted from the floor. The content disclosed through these two avenues can prove to be harmful and to complicate matters more are inadvertently collected through the more recent push for audio video streaming of council meetings. So how do we stay compliant? We need to acknowledge what information is being shared and remind our audience of our FOIP requirements. Review the content being considered and collect items and apply exceptions before further disclosure after the meeting. There are specific instances when it is appropriate to hold a meeting of council in the absence of the public. Moving a meeting in camera should be an exception or last resort. The MGA permits in-camera meetings only if the matter falls within one of the sections under Division 2, Part 1 of the FOIP Act. These matters may include the security of property owned by the municipality, personal information of an individual or an employee, or a proposed or pending acquisition or disposal of property by or for the public body. It also includes labor relations or employee negotiations and a law enforcement matter or litigation. Again and again, we have seen elected officials privy to sensitive and personal information in their agenda packages. While it is important for administration to protect personal and sensitive information, we find it a struggle to balance the need to protect that information with the need to provide enough to the elected official to make an informed decision. Therefore, it is important to remember not to disclose all of the details set out within your agenda package as many details may not necessarily be made public. We would also like to offer a few tips, for instance, having the content expert or request for decision writer minimize the amount of information shared within their agenda item and have them be more prepared to respond to questions when more information is required by council during the actual meeting. Also, if more personal information and sensitive information is required, move in camera at that point if further disclosure is necessary to make an informed decision and then go back to the open meeting. As our number one customer, we engage with the public and our residents daily. We use many different means of engagement from surveys, meetings, one-on-one -on -one interaction to public hearings and open houses. There are many aspects of these types of interactions that must be considered. Ask yourself what information is being collected and why. Do we have the authority to collect that information? And is it necessary to perform our duties or provide our service? Have we provided notice of how it will be used? And is it sensitive information? If so, how are we going to protect it? And are we sharing this information and with whom? There have been numerous times when we've had um, employees come to us with the idea of having a public house or public hearing or open house, um, wanting to have surveys available with uh, numerous sections that give the opportunity to provide personal information or opinions. So it's at that point we go back and we look at the real purpose of the survey. One of a public body's focus areas, in addition to providing its services, is to bring in business. Elected officials, administration, and economic development often engage or respond to potential clients. Typically, this involves information sharing, and therefore, all parties must consider their privacy obligations. Think about what information these potential clients are asking for. Does it include landowner or competitive uh, information? Are they asking for draft documents? For example, future planning or strategy strategy plans or reports? And how sensitive is this information when they're sharing, that they are sharing with us? Is it being shared explicitly or implicitly in confidence? Does it meet the three-part test as a mandatory exception to disclosure? And is the information even a formal representation of their proposition or opportunity? 
or are they merely in the preliminary or exploratory stages and therefore sharing informal information with us? In addition to these considerations, we must always be cognizant of our relationships with different public bodies and levels of government. I hope that one of the biggest takeaways uh, with this section of the presentation today is um, this. If you lose a device, tablet, laptop, briefcase, or any records, you need to report it immediately. By reporting the loss immediately, the public body can mitigate any risk, but more importantly, any potential harm. If we are aware of the loss, the IT department may be able to wipe the device um, of content that is on it. Also, if we know what content was lost, we can provide notification to affected parties and if need be, contact the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. Always remember that what you say and what you write is spoilable. Think to yourself, do I want this on the cover of a major newspaper? If the answer is no, then it is probably best to document it, not to document it. If you know what content you have, you will find that not only will you be able to respond to your constituents more effectively, but you will know what you may have lost and what information is particularly sensitive. Also, managing your records means that you are following the prescribed retention and final disposition requirements, which help you to keep what you need for the appropriate amount of time and destroy the content you are legally permitted to destroy. While performing your duties, you can all agree administration shares sensitive information in the form of reports, submissions, and agenda packages. It is imperative you protect the records in your custody. There are three different types of security measures that can be put in place. These can be divided into three categories, physical, technical, and administrative. Physical safeguards protect against the physical intrusion, such as someone gaining unauthorized access to personal information that may be in paper files. Technical safeguards protect personal information stored on electronic devices, such as computers. And there are administrative safeguards, which protect personal information by guiding employees in their day-to-day -day handling of personal information. Finally, I want to remind you that there are plenty of resources available if you find yourself struggling with any access and privacy roadblocks or dilemmas. Websites that offer great resources include the OIPCs and Service Alberta's. You can find FAQs, contact numbers, bulletins, guides, investigation reports, and so on, all available on this, these websites. Also, remember you have a great set of resources right at your fingertips that are experienced working with your public body content while balancing your access and privacy requirements. Talk to your public body senior administration team and your FOIP coordinator if you have questions or are ever concerned about content being collected or disclosed by the public body. So thank you and uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear the next presenter. Thank you very much, Jody. My name is Christy Eisert. I'm the Legislative Advisor at the City of Cold Lake. Can everyone hear me all right? I don't see anything. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be speaking this afternoon about uh, the City of Cold Lake's transition to electronic records management, um, some of the success and some of the challenges that we've had, and what that transition has looked like. So first off, the City of Cold Lake, if any of you haven't visited us yet, um, one of the most beautiful cities in Alberta. Uh, the city was actually established in 1996 through the amalgamation of three small towns, the town of Grand Centre, the town of, Grand, of Cold Lake, and the Canadian Forces Base Four Wing. So because we were created through amalgamation in 1996, there's been some recent and very unique records management challenges as it relates to three small communities being joined together. So the population of the city of Cold Lake right now is 15,736 people and we're about uh, three to four hours uh, northeast of Edmonton and at this time there's 125 full-time employees at the city of Cold Lake. 
So currently, the city's record management strategy um, could be broken down into the electronic records and our physical records. So prior to going into any type of transition into an electronic records management uh, solution, we found that the majority of our records were physical records in paper format. We had large storage rooms, uh, file cabinets in many people's offices, and we had office desks where a lot of records could be found. There was various copies of these records also throughout the City of Cold Lake administration. On the other side, there's the electronic records, um, which the majority of the City of Cold Lake's electronic records were in the file drives, personal drives, desktops, and Microsoft Outlook environments um, created through email. So the area of electronic records which we've been focusing on and trying to transition and shift is the area in orange. So those file drives, personal drives, desktops, and Microsoft uh, Outlook environments. We've been trying to shift that orange space into the SharePoint and Collabware environment, which is an enterprise content management solution. In addition to our SharePoint and Collabware environment, which hopefully uh, will end up holding all of those electronic records, we also have some specialized records uh, generating and storage softwares. Uh, for example, we use call to order for our agenda packages. We use Bellamy for our financial records, Report Exec. FirePro and Glitner. So the City of Cold Lake found that there were some significant challenges with the traditional file drive system. So we found that the file drives had become completely manageable. So there was a lack of standardized naming conventions being used and there was many duplicates being saved in various different locations on the file drive. It was very difficult to find any of these records saved because they were sometimes saved under employees' names or a folder entitled, for example, important files. Um, and it would be very difficult with staff turnover to ever find that record again. Uh, secondly, with our, the number of FOIP requests and the complexity of the FOIP requests from our, through the City of Cold Lake have been gradually increasing. So we found that searching through the file drive system was ineffective and inefficient and we needed to come up with a solution to better manage our records so we could adhere to the legislative uh, requirements under the FOIP legislation. We also found with our retention schedule that it was very complex and it was confusing to actually figure out which classifications should be used for which records and there was a lot of user error because of this. So similar with to the province of Alberta, we've been transitioning to a big bucket approach where we're simplifying and rewriting our retention schedule to try to uh, address this issue. So we further found that with our retention schedule, it was very difficult to enforce uh, any retention when the file drive system held the majority of our records as well as our Microsoft Outlook environment. So it was unrealistic and impossible for our staff to go back and search through the file drive system to try to find their records and then delete them when they needed to be deleted or archive them. And lastly, we found that there was significant inconsistency between departments and record management procedures and practices and a lack of understanding of the importance of records management as it related to the city of Cold Lake being the owner of the records and there not being a need for each department to hold a copy of each record. So in order to address these challenges, we determined that we needed to move to a records management system which was centralized. So no more departments acting as silos where they kept their own records in their own way. We needed a one size uh, solution for the city of Cold Lake in general. We wanted a system that was automated. So we wanted to reduce the number of decisions that our users had to make about how they were going to classify or where they were going to save their records. We wanted a simple solution where um, our users just used their records and didn't have to think about those record management principles. We wanted to go electronic so we could reduce the number of paper copies we were having to manage. We wanted to integrate our retention schedule 
and automate the application of those retention periods to ensure that we had a consistent application of our retention schedule across departments um, and across uh, users. We wanted to ensure that any system we moved to was legally defensible and that we could make sense of, understand and defend how our records were transitioning through their life cycle. We wanted to ensure that our FOIP request could be completed effectively um, and thoroughly. We needed to ensure that all of our records were being searched for FOIP requests when they needed to be um, and that there was no areas that were being left uh, unsearched. We wanted to ensure that this system would be user friendly and that it had a potential to grow and adapt as our organization grew and changed. So we determined that we needed an enterprise content management solution. So what that means is essentially the practices, processes, methodology, which allows the technology to be used to manage, store, and secure content. So we decided that the platform we would use was SharePoint, and that's a Microsoft program. Because SharePoint doesn't have its own inherent record management um, processes, or it doesn't have too many of them, we decided to use Collabware, which is a third-party records management uh, software to add on to SharePoint. So between SharePoint and this third-party record software working together, we were able to manage uh, the records and their transition. So we chose SharePoint and Collabware because we knew we had a legal obligation to keep our records. We knew that this software would increase the likelihood of record maintenance for future use. So as we had more staff turnover, uh, we found that there were a lot of challenges in being able to recover important documents and ensure they were always being saved in a very consistent way. We've, we knew it would promote effective use and flow of documents between departments because this software allows for workflows to be developed and documents to be checked in and out so they can be used by more than one user at different times. We knew it would save energy, time, and financial resources on our physical storage facilities, on the organization of documents and trying to later find documents through the confusing file drive system. It would save uh, a lot of time on manual record retention scheduling and FOIP request document recovery. Overall, this whole process will reduce the risk of document loss and increase the effective recovery of documents for our FOIP requests and other legal matters. And ultimately, we hope it will eliminate many of our duplicates. So the traditional file drive system looks very different from the SharePoint and Collabware electronic record management environment. So the first major difference is how records are stored and how the location of record storage is determined. So with the traditional file drive system, users decide where they want to store their records. They open up subfolders and subfolders and subfolders. They choose the names of those folders most often, and they tuck their documents in wherever they see best fit. With the SharePoint and Collabware environment, there's large record repositories used, which are set up by the records managers in a consistent way. So the users do not get to choose the location where their records are saved. The second major difference is how records are retrieved. So with the traditional file drive system, it's completely dependent on users to remember what location they've saved their records into and re remember the names of the folders um, that they've created. So often you'll see employees searching with the, the large search function at the top of the file drives and share drives looking for keywords to hope that those were the words used to save their records so they can recover them. With the SharePoint and Collabware environment, large document repositories are searched by key metadata, which are established by the records management team. The third big difference is how retention periods are managed. So with the traditional file drive system, again, it's completely dependent on users to take the paper version of the record, usually box it and label it with the retention period, and then store it in a uh, location usually a records room or file cabinet. And the electronic version of records are somewhere in the file drives or somewhere in email that need to be sorted manually. So every time a retention period is coming close to its end, those 
each employee would need to look through the spaces where they save their records and try to recover those records and get rid of them as they need to or archive them. With the SharePoint and Collaborate environment, categories of records are set with a compliance policy. The compliance policy attaches to the retention period. So what happens is that when the user uploads a specific type of record, that type of record has already been set with the retention period to it. So when a retention period expires, a notification is provided and the disposition of that record is signaled. There's also uh, different options that can be set up to have different levels of review of those records. So if for some reason the record um, was input as the wrong type of record, that can be corrected. But basically this takes away the users having to go through records and determine when they're coming up on their retention period. Fourthly, the destruction of records and how the destruction of records is tracked is very different. So with the traditional file drive system, usually spreadsheets are used where just records that need to be destroyed are entered in um, and the names of those records are saved and then they're shredded. And hopefully, um, destruction of the paper record is also uh, coincides with destruction of the all electronic versions of those records. With SharePoint and Collabware, a record disposition uh, record is actually produced so that you can produce a record which says when the record was destroyed, how it was destroyed, and there's confidence that that record can't be retrieved. So document sharing and editing amongst users is different as well. So in the traditional file drive system, several versions of records are usually saved, sent through emails, or used through shared drives. This can signal a whole bunch of different versions, and it can be difficult for users to know that they're working on the current most updated version, and that that version isn't being edited by more than one user at one time. With SharePoint and Collabware, the records can be checked out for editing, and version history can be saved. So you can go to different versions of that record, but if someone is currently working on it, you know that because it'll be checked out for editing, and then once it comes back to be checked in, it can be worked on by another user. So with a traditional file drive system, it's almost impossible to know that all records have been searched when, for example, a FOIA request comes in. In order to know that every area where records are saved is searched, users would have to check every folder, their desktops, email environments, manually searching their offices, searching through basically every location where they keep records. Whereas with SharePoint and Collabware, searches are instantaneous. As metadata can be searched by the records manager, it significantly reduces the amount of time and energy that users have to spend searching their records. This is just a screenshot of uh, the front end portal from our SharePoint environment. So you can see that it looks very different from the file drive system in that where you'll see in blue, it says new document with a little plus sign and a circle. Below that area, across the screen, you'll see name, address, development permit number, building permit number, permit number, roll number. Those are examples of metadata which have been set so when these records are uploaded to this particular library, the type of record it is is chosen, and then those fields are entered. So we can search for these records based on the metadata fields which have been input. So essentially, big picture, what we're trying to do is shift from a user control records management system to a system that is very centralized and is an intentional process where a lot of thought and energy goes into how our records are going to be organized uh, for future use, that when departments change or staff change, there shouldn't be a disruption of our record management process. So with the traditional file drive system, users are required uh, to put a lot of time, energy, and thought into how they're going to save records and how they're going to manage the records that they have saved. It's a manual, non-standardized process. With SharePoint and Collabware, records managers are in control largely with how the system is set up. So it is automated and standardized and very consistent for everyone. So some of the successes we've had at the City of Cold Lake 
with this transition has been that SharePoint and Collabware have been deployed. We have at this time approximately 30,000 records uploaded. They're permanent landfall records. So before we could get them into the SharePoint environment, we had to design the library for our land files. We had to go through many, many boxes of records, sort them, digitize them, and get them uploaded into this environment. We've also sorted through approximately 3,000 extra large property and land plans and maps, which we've digitized in-house with a large format scanner. These records have been uploaded into SharePoint. So one of our four major city departments are currently utilizing SharePoint for all of their current records. We're finding that there is an increased interest from other departments who are anxious to transition to SharePoint because they're hearing that it's working and that it's easier to find records and manage records. And our retention schedule is being reviewed and rewritten for our other departments. So it's been redrafted for three of our four city departments and we've moved to a big bucket theory where we've reduced the number of categories and, uh, that can be chosen so that there's larger, more intuitive uh, categories for our records. So there are several ongoing challenges that we're finding. Any major change management movement can be very difficult. Um, kind of highlighting one of the major challenges that we've found is just that the skills that are required of a records manager who manages paper records and the file drive is very different than the skills and the expertise needed of records managers who are going to manage an electronic records management system like SharePoint and Collabware. So while the skill set has changed, our people are generally the same. So there can be a really uh, significant gap in knowledge and training that's required to try to bridge that gap in understanding. On the same thread, we found that our IT professionals must be able to understand the business processes and rule-based record-keeping principles to ensure that the software they're deploying is deployed in a way that is effective and useful for our users. So just clicking the Go button on SharePoint isn't enough. There's many decisions that need to be made to set up the system effectively for the specific records and use of our city. Our records managers must thoroughly understand enterprise content management, all the software we're utilizing, and have significant technical proficiency. And we found that that technical proficiency isn't something that was necessarily required of our records managers before. Because there can be such a large gap in knowledge and expertise between our IT department and our records management department, we found a key area um, to work on is the cohesion between our IT professionals and our records management professionals. We need to ensure that while we have different areas of expertise, that we can at least speak the same language to each other. And that's a language of electronic records management and what we need. So communication can be really key. While it's difficult to bridge the IT professional ex uh, expertise and the records management expertise, we found that there isn't a lot of resources out there that can help us to bridge this gap. So that's an area that we're still working on. In addition to training uh, that's required for our records managers and our IT professionals, all of our users also need to be trained on SharePoint. So they don't need to know the details of how the back-end record center works or how compliance policies are developed or added to different records categories, but they do need to know how to use SharePoint so that they can give buy-in to the program and find the records that they need. We found that email, as was mentioned by the province of Alberta today, can present a really unique challenge. We know that in order for email to be managed properly, every one of our email users has to be committed to managing their email with the same diligence as they apply to management of all other records. So decisions need to be made as to what email needs to be saved and what email can be deleted. And we know most email can be deleted, but it can be 
challenging to get all of our um, employees on board. In order to implement any type of major change management like this, we need buy-in and commitment to this change from the whole organization, especially from the top down, but from all of our employees enjoying uh, the change as well and finding it to be effective. And in order to reach that full implementation, we know that significant resources are needed. And then lastly, we found that without a reactive driver for this change, records management is rarely prioritized. So while new fire halls and new splash parks and infrastructure and community programming can be very sexy and can be something that's politically um, really pushed, we find that records management is often kind of in the background and it doesn't always get the um, prioritization that's maybe needed to drive this major type of a change. So we know records management is very, very important. We know that we really need to move to this type of standardized system, um, but getting that prioritization can be challenging. So I have just a couple um, slides left, and I just wanted to uh, speak to a few of the things that we found overall um, that may be useful if other communities are looking, looking at making this type of transition. So one thing to be cautious about is we found that our current state of records is we have a lot of duplicates. We've got some electronic records and we've got some paper records and physical records. We're hoping in the future to move to a situation where we have more electronic records, less physical records, and no duplicates. So the overall volume or number of records that we're managing should be less than what we have today. What we're finding, however, is that sometimes people aren't as convinced about the safety of electronic records management and still want to keep their paper copies. So we're finding that if there isn't an organizational will to get rid of paper copies of records, that what you can actually end up doing is doubling the number of records that you're managing because you're managing your electronic records system and now you're also still managing all your paper records. So it can be uh, a cautionary <laughs> to think about the number or volume of records you're managing, the amount of people that you have, and whether you're going to be able to manage an electronic records management system, as well as still manage all of your paper records through your file rooms, for example. The other thing we found is there needs to be a really a significant commitment to planning before implementation takes place. So there has to be a conversation with records users about what type of records they have, whether they create the record or it's something they receive, why they have the record, what is its purpose, and how long they need to keep that record. So do they have particular needs for the record that maybe the records managers aren't aware of? These types of questions have to be asked so that the metadata, content types, location, and security permissions can be set within the type of software that you choose to use. We found that often these types of questions haven't been asked of our records users. So there can be challenges with having the users of the records even think about and to be able to describe or talk about their records in this type of way. It can be a long process but it's really needed that time commitment be put into it so that the decisions to plan out your records management system can be made before you get going and put records into the system. There can also be a significant push to focus on records going forward and not look at your dated records or historical records, which can be in boxes and records rooms and very time consuming to go through. But we found that by going through many of the dated records, we've then been able to develop a broader understanding of what the city's records look like and what the record management structure should look like. So the different categories and types of records we have could be determined uh, by looking through a lot of those, those old boxes or those old areas of paper records as well. So it can be a bit of a struggle. 
so that is all I have for you for my presentation. Um, if, if anyone's interested in um, speaking more about this area, if you're looking to transition yourself, uh, my contact information is, is right on the slide. So thank you. Hi everyone, sorry, it's Zori um, from AUMA. Um, hope you can hear me. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left for questions. Um, so if you've had any of the questions of um, the presenters, please feel free to type them in the chat box. If it's uh, for a specific presenter, it'd be great if you could let me know who you would like to answer your question. I see we have a bunch of questions coming in, so people typing them. So we'll just wait for them to come in, see if there's anything. Yeah, lots of thank yous to all our presenters. Thanks to Jody and a lot of the presenters, Christy too, and Maureen. Um, I'll let you see some things coming in still, people typing, so I'll wait to see. Okay, so there's a question for uh, Christy. So, Christy, what was the time frame for planning, implementation, and to date? Um, so, what we found at the City of Cold Lake is we purchased the software approximately four years ago. Um, so I just joined the city of Cold Lake about a year and a half ago. Um, so there's been ongoing implementation, I would say on and off, for several years. The software was certainly purchased before uh, implementation went full speed ahead. So with the last year and a half, we've really been working um, a lot more diligently on trying to get this process updated, we found that it took a lot of time to go back through some of our old records to even get our paper records in shape, that we could even think about them in terms of uh, implementing them into SharePoint and Collabor. So we are still, um, we've implemented the one of three, or sorry, one of four major departments, and we're in the planning stages for the other three departments as it's going. Um, I would say the planning phase uh, takes it takes a lot more time than I want to even admit. <laughs> um, but I think depending on um, how organized your records are first off um, really dictates how much time is going to take to plan it to move forward as well. Thank you. So then this question is for Christy Tews, so do you have a ballpark of how much implementation of the SharePoint Collabware was? Um, in terms of how much money I think you're asking, um, I'm not certain. With the, with the City of Cold Lake right now, um, I'm head for the legislative department, so in addition to uh, all the records management, we also do all of the FOIP and all of bylaws policy, um, all of that other stuff as well. But within the legislative department, we've got four full-time staff and a summer staff right now. So there's five of us within the department looking after that. Um, I, I don't know the resources in terms of our IT time, and we've certainly had uh, external IT consultants as well doing some of the background work. Um, yeah, and support and maintenance has been a quite significant. Um, I might be a bit scared to actually know the numbers. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Maureen, and um, I was just talking to Maureen when because she was answering, and she doesn't actually have the answer to this, but we're going to get back to you. So, um, Wendy, I, I just to make sure I have your contact information, could you type it in the chat box? So just. Um, for everyone, Linnea's question is what um, she's wondering is if there's any standards and processes being developed to address information management for the Alberta Occupation Health and Safety Records Management. So Linnea, if you put your in your email address, I'll make sure we get back to you. Um, thank you. 
Um, okay, so we have a question again for Cole Lake. So how, oh, so she, yes, how many dedicated staff members and you answer that? Um, see. Uh, um, you know, there's a question about the slides. Um, I will be sending out a PDF of all the slides of this presentation, so you will have access to that along with the recording, probably next week. Um, Renee, I thanks for putting in your email address. So we have about another 10 minutes, so let me know if you have any other questions. Um, I think Madden from the County of uh, Grand Prairie just uh, asked to confirm we do at the City of Cool Lake have five in the Legislative Department, four full-time and uh, one extra in the summer, taking on this project um, with a lot of other projects as well. Um, and it is our Legislative Department that's leading the implementation of our SharePoint and Collaborate transition and we're working hand-in-hand -hand with our IT Department. Thanks for giving your email address, which you registered. Yeah, I have that email. We'll send it out to you. Um, okay, it looks like Sherry from the County of Grand Prairie might have something. Are you typing something? So we'll wait for her question. For those of you that are interested in other AUA webinars, the webinar coming up at the end of this month on regarding um, newcomers and his webinar in August on, on media relations. Those are you can all find out more on our AUA events page on AUA.ca. Um, oh, here's a question from Sherry. Um, so it's from to Christy. So um, we're also working closely with our IT department. I have any questions for you? I'll email you. Okay, so she'll be in touch by email. Looks like we have a question coming in from Vivian in the City of Lacombe. Um, okay, so to City of Lacombe, uh, sorry, from City of Lacombe to Christy, is your SharePoint land files connected to your GIS system? No, they're not now, not at this point. I'm scared to talk. I'm not sure if everyone will be able to hear me, but um, this is Jody Jackson from Sturgeon County. And um, responding to the question regarding the landfalls um, being connected to GIS, I know at Sturgeon County we use um, HP Trim, and we've been able to connect our HP Trim records with our GIS uh, records. So when we are in Esri software, we can click on the parcel and included in the uh, property metadata is um, the trim file number that corresponds with that parcel of land. So we found that really helpful for our end users. Okay, so we have a question from Vivian. Um, so has Cole Lake implemented any particular policies for email management? Uh, the City of Cold Lake is currently working on some policies for email management. We've got a few drafts. Um, we're still working with some of our other departments um, to see to ensure that there that the drafts will work for everyone. Um, there's quite a bit of reluctance we find with email management, um, just in terms of I think it's a perception thing that um, some of our users use their email and feel it's their own personal their own personal records and their own personal way to manage them. So we, we definitely know we need to do some work as a terms in relation to how people think about their emails and then um, push forward a little more heavily on requirements for email management because it's, it's certainly a challenge for us in Cold Lake right now. Um, so you have about five, six minutes. Looks like Vivian might have another question or comment. Oh, thank you to the presenters. That was great. Um, thank you, Vivian. Any other questions? We'll give it a couple minutes here. So yeah, if you uh, would like to be in, to hear about our other webinars, we've had a lot taking place over the last few weeks and months, including one on the MGA review. You can go and look at our um, 
YouTube channel. All the recordings are put there. Okay, looks like we have another comment from Linnea coming through or question and Rochelle. Um, oh, thanks for from all so the six of us and all. It's very informative. Um, Linnea, thanks to everyone. Look forward to the slides. Okay, so um, so I think this question will be from Maureen. So Maureen, the question is from Rochelle. So does Service Alberta provide any draft documents for records management instead of having to reinvent the wheel? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Um, Rochelle, it's Maureen. Um, we have a number of documents available um, on our website, our public facing website, and the address is www.im.gov.ab.ca. We have a variety of publications as well as standards and policies available there. Uh, we also, part of our standards process is um, we don't have uh, um, standards generated for the IMT community on our website. However, we do link directly to where those standards are housed. It is still with Service Alberta. It's just on another page. So I would invite you to go um, look at that information. And if you have any further questions, you can send me an email. So you have about four minutes left. Um, so if you have any question, Rochelle's typing something back. Thank you to Maureen. So um, the recording will be sent out in the next uh, next week with the slides. You can watch for that. An article will be in our in our um, newsletter too. It doesn't look like there's anything coming through. So with that, I'm going to um, sign off. Thank again, thank you again for all the participants. Um, thank you again to our presenters. Um, and uh, we look, you'll get the slides and the recording next week. Um, it'll, be, and it'll be on our YouTube channel. Um, lots of good, thanks for all the, the compliments with the quality of the session. OK, we will talk to you soon. And um, for those of you that are attending Mayor's Caucus and Olds, I will see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>